Ah, uh, these Gen Z kids ringing my door. Oh, <laughs> hey, it's you. That's an annoying bell, isn't it? Are you done? <laughs> Anyways, welcome to my home. I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs, and yeah, this is the new place. Okay, so it's not new, it's over 120 years old, but it's new to me. Yeah, we got moving boxes everywhere and it's kind of messy, but we love it. Except for one thing that really bothers me. My wife couldn't care less, but it's right here. That's the state of our networking in this home. No, that's not an old school Ethernet jack. That's a telephone jack. There's two of them in the house and that's it. Now you might be thinking, hold on Quinn, it's 2021. Surely the people that lived here before you had the internet. Yeah, probably up until the mid 2000s, they had dial up like most Americans. And then also like most Americans upgraded to something like this, a cable router with a modem, a router, and a wireless access point built in. Here's the problem though, that's not ideal. Wired devices are much more reliable, their speed is much higher, and when you want Wi-Fi in your home, you really ought to have multiple access points. Having one of these and jamming it into the cupboard in your basement is not going to provide a good internet experience. But there is no ethernet cable in my house. There's nowhere to run access points and those mesh networks are fine, but they're not ideal. So in this video, I am going to retrofit my crazy old house with ethernet cabling in almost every room. I'm going to put modern advanced wireless access points in most of the rooms. And last, I am going to get gigabit fiber so that this 120 year old house can feel blazing fast. And I'm going to show you how to do it. So if interested, you can do it to your kind of old home. It's not hard. It just takes a lot of work. So let's begin. Now, before you do anything, you need to consider step number zero, the planning phase. I'm generally a measure once, drill twice type of guy, but when it comes to networking, I am not. Not because it's dangerous or because it's hard, but because, well, you're gonna run into issues. And if you don't anticipate those issues before they happen, they're going to add up, you're going to become very frustrated and you're gonna question why you did this at all and why you even own a home. And you'll consider lighting it on fire, which is insurance fraud and you will not get your money back and you'll go to jail. Anyway, as a general rule of thumb, there are three ways to do this. The first one and the easiest one by far is through existing cable drops in your wall. If you've got telephone wire somewhere or if you've got coaxial cable inside your walls that you don't mind abandoning, well, just take that old cable, cut off the connector, tie the new ethernet cable to it, go to your crawl space or your attic, pull the old cable up, you've got the new cable there, <laughs> you're done. Go celebrate a Texas Roadhouse, you lucky son of a bitch. The second way, and this is a way that I'm going to take advantage of occasionally in my retrofit, is to be a little lazy and to, instead of try to trifle with wires inside your walls, well, to, to just go outside of your house. That's right, you punch through your foundation or through your attic space, you go down or up along the exterior wall of your home and you punch back in where you want that ethernet cable or access point. It's actually less disruptive than you think. You're gonna wanna seal them with silicone caulk or whatever, but it, it's a really good way to do stuff and it is very, very simple. The last way, and it's not very fun, but it's doable is to go through interior walls. Now, interior walls generally don't have insulation. So unlike exterior walls, you're not gonna have a really difficult time pushing the cable down or up to where it needs to be so you can grab it in the hole you've pre-prepared. And don't worry, we'll do this. But it's much easier if you have drywall because you just pick a couple of studs, you drop the cable down in and you're good. My house is problematic because I don't have gravity to help me. I have a crawl space, not an attic, so I gotta push it up. And then my walls are made out of lath and plaster, which is really sucky because it's really rigid and there's nails and all sorts of stuff inside my walls that'll snag onto the cable at any instant. So I'm gonna show you how to do mine, but those are the three ways. Think about how you're gonna do them. Crawl in your crawl space, crawl in your attic, and figure out where you're gonna put the cables and how you're gonna make it all happen before you do it. What better video than this to talk about our friend and sponsor, Private Internet Access. Look, if you're watching this video, you know what a VPN is, but if you need an endorsement, I have been a pain customer of PIA for a long time before they ever decided to sponsor the channel. As expected, they don't do any logging ever. They have a wide swath of apps for just about every platform you can imagine, and their accounts support up to 10 simultaneous connections, which is a gotcha that a lot of inexpensive VPNs have, but not PIA. Of course, you get access to region-locked content, uh, my wife has been using it to watch the BBC classic Gavin and Stacey. And with almost 20,000 servers in 70 countries, it is rare that I run into proxy issues. Try PIA today. You can pay with just about any method you want, including Bitcoin. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. 
So use my link below to support the channel and save with two years plus three months free at just $2.59 per month. Thanks to PIA for sponsoring this episode. Okay, let's talk equipment. I'm not going to be using one of these. <laughs> this is a modem, a router, and a wireless access point. And the reality about these things is they don't really do any of those jobs particularly well. Uh, my Google Fiber internet connection has what they call a fiber jack. So it comes in on actual fiber. And if you wanna know how a fiber network facility works, check out our tour we did last year with Utopia. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, I have the fiber coming into my house and then it terminates inside of this little box and changes to copper RJ45 ethernet cable. Then for my router or for my gateway, I have selected a Ubiquiti Dream Machine Pro. Now I bought one of these last year for our office when we moved everything to 10 gig networking and it is fantastic. We love it. It's really great. And that was a no brainer in my mind for this home. It is a server rack mount product. It's kind of intended for you know small businesses, not really intended for homes, but I think it's price to performance is really great. It's an excellent gateway and I generally really recommend it. And the best thing about buying one of those is that you can use Ubiquiti's excellent security cameras, which I'll be putting up on the house, as well as their amazing Wi-Fi access points. These things, all they do is Wi-Fi, nothing else. And so it's kind of like a mesh network, but it's way better because you wire every single one of these in. They don't repeat the signal, they broadcast the same signal. So these are their in-wall HDs, which just sit flush on your drywall. And then we've got these Nano HDs, which are a little larger and kind of more access pointy looking. Here's the thing though, I didn't know how many of these I actually needed because this house is uh, old, it has really thick walls, there's a lot of brick, but I didn't wanna overdo it because if you put too many wireless access points in your house, handoff actually gets pretty difficult to do and Wi-Fi gets worse. So I discovered that Unify has this really handy design center tool. You upload a floor plan of your house, and if you don't have one, like I didn't, uh, I was able to use an iPad app called Magic Plan. I think it's on the iPhone too. And it uses AR and LiDAR, if you have that on your device, to measure the dimensions of your home and create rooms. I went a little overkill because I wanted it to be exact and used a Bosch laser rangefinder as well, which works with the app, really, really cool and handy. But yeah, in general, it was pretty easy to make a floor plan. And then I uploaded that to Ubiquiti's design center. And then I basically tell it what walls are super thick, like brick or concrete, what walls are interior walls, and then where are my windows? And that generally will recommend to you how each of their wireless products will perform in your home, which is really handy. And they also tell you when you have too many. So I went through and decided based on where I could actually reasonably run my cable drops, well, this is where I can put an access point. What happens if I put this one here? What happens if I put this one here? And for the best five gigahertz coverage in my home, I decided to go with two in-wall HDs and two nano HDs. And I think it'll work out really, really well. So that's the equipment. Now we need to actually do the hard part and that is running the cables. Okay, but what type of cabling should I be using? You're wondering. Well, that's easy, ethernet cable. Okay, so it's not that easy because it's a little more intricate than that. You see, all ethernet cable in general in design is built the same. If I strip the jacket off of this inside, you will see four twisted pairs, four colors with a corresponding striped wire. And so long as they're in the, the same order on both ends of the cable, well, the cable will work. However, your real world performance and the length of cable run you can do is determined by two main factors, the category and the rating. Cat5 or Cat5e is by far the mo most ubiquitous cable you'll see around, and it's been around for decades. It carries gigabit speeds very reliably. I don't recommend that in a new deployment like this because while gigabit is awesome, theoretically in the next 10 or 15 years, the likelihood of us using 10 plus gig networking is, well, it, it's there. There's reason to install this cable if it's not that much more money, and it, it's really not. This is category six cable. And CAT6, in my opinion, is pretty underrated. There are newer standards like CAT6A, CAT7, and there's even a CAT8 on the horizon. Now CAT6, 6A, and 7 are all rated for 10 gigabits per second. However, CAT6 is only rated for 10 gigabits per second at less than 55 meters of a run. 
Now, 55 meters is, is still quite a bit, and in your house, you're likely to not have a single cable run over 55 meters. The reason I recommend Cat 6, and the reason I'm going to use it, is because like Cat 5e, it is extremely easy to work with. It's very easy to terminate and crimp, and it, your life just goes better. Cat 6a and Cat 7 have all this crazy shielding and these difficult jackets that make it a real hassle to work with. And the performance in your home likely won't be any different. Now, if we're talking an office building, sure, but in a home, no. So Cat 6 is what I'm doing. It's what I recommend. Now, let's talk about the rating. There are a bunch of ratings, CMR, CM, CMX, uh, CMP. Really, you don't need to know any of them. This is CMR. This is rated for indoor usage. Uh, CMP is rated for plenum usage, so inside air ducting. And then CMX, sometimes it's also called heavy duty, is rated for outdoor usage. So I'm using CMX outside for running my cameras when I have cable runs on the exterior of my home. Uh, those are only rated for single gigabit, but that's fine. The rest is 10 gigabit capable Cat6 that's just chilling in my basement. So let's talk about how I'm gonna fish it around. Welcome to my creepy crawl space where uh, Pennywise and the Haunt of Iris definitely do not reside. I did find this really, really old Sears newspaper advertisement, however, for a $138 two-speed Kenmore washing machine. This is probably my insulation. Ah, <laughs> okay. So I took a two inch hole saw and cut a hole right above where I intend to place my server rack. And then I fished all of this pre-cut cable down through the wall. I have the lengths already measured out for where I intend to send each cable. And I've made sure that it's the right category and rating for its intended use. So this one right here, I can tell this is outdoor rated cable. And yep, it says front camera right here. So you can choose to do this like I've done. I want each ethernet port in my house to have its own 10 gig dedicated link back to the switch, back to the network. But you may choose to use, uh, you know, five port switches. That's okay too. Just depends on how much time you're willing to spend cabling. But I figure if you're down here crawling in your grody basement, you might as well do it right from the get go. But now I have to put it to where they're actually going. They're all spooled up, but it doesn't do any good here. So. I'm going to wire these to where in the crawl space they need to go, just below, because again, this is my house. We're going to drill through the subfloor down into this basement, and I'd like to have the cable in the right spot. Now, rather than just wiring it all on the ground, I would suggest you get one of these. This is a stapler. They're not too much money, and what's cool is they're rated for Ethernet cables. So I can go to my floor joist right here and snap and check it out. My cable's held up, but what you might notice is that it still is able to slide. That's because the spacers there don't allow the cable to pinch the ethernet cable. And that's good because if you pinch and severely kink these cables, you can affect your 10 gig speeds. So yeah, get a stapler like this, get the cables out of the way, organize them a little bit and put them where they need to go. Now let's go back upstairs and drill down through our floor. I'm here in my home's only room that has drywall because that's likely what you have in your home, and I want to demonstrate that. But if you do have lath and plaster like me, you're in an older home, the process is pretty much the same. It's just, well, it's a lot messier. Step number one, regardless of wall type, is going to be identifying your studs. Uh-oh, I'm a stud. If you have drywall, that's really easy. Just use a stud finder. If you have lath and plaster, it's a little trickier. You can buy a pricier magnetic stud finder that will actually identify the nails that your lath is nailed into, or you can use a neodymium magnet if your plaster isn't too thick to identify the nails attached to your stud. Interesting. Uh, after you've done that, you're going to need one of these. This is a low voltage old work box. Old work because it's got these little ears on the back, and so it attaches to the wall without any, um, you know, screws. And then the other thing that it does is it has a big cavity in the middle, unlike most boxes which are enclosed. Now for low voltage wiring like coaxial cable, ethernet and the like, you don't need to have a back of a box. And so these are so much easier to work with. It's easier to route cable. They are awesome and they're like a dollar. So get a couple of these. Then you are going to take a pencil and stick it through the four holes that are around the corner of the box. And this will give you four reference points for where you need to make incisions in your wall. I usually take the uh, uh, box itself and then just make straight lines so that I know where to cut. And then using either a multi-tool if you're lazy or a drywall saw if you uh, don't have a tool like this or 
you know, want to use tools intended for the specific task you're performing, these are great. Then we have a hole in our wall. Pretty easy. All we have to do after that is, well, get a drill bit through the floor. Yeah, one of these. These are designed to, well, create cavities inside of your subfloor when you have an existing framed wall in the way. Um, they are kind of a pain to use. There are a bunch of brands that uh, make them. I will link the few that I've used that I enjoy and a few of the ones that I would recommend staying away from. But basically, it's just an auger, your standard kind of drill bit, with a little threaded screw at the beginning to really grab into your subfloor, and then a long, flexible shaft. And the purpose of this is to allow you to drill straight down inside of the wall from above. So you're going to need one of these bits. You're going to need a cordless drill. You're going to need one of these. Well, you don't need one of these, but I find them useful. Basically what it does is it just ensures that your drill bit stays uh, 90 degrees from the floor while you're in the wall to make sure that you don't drill at an angle. All right, I have a couple of techniques and suggestions for you. Suggestion number one, make sure that when you begin drilling, your drill bit is at a square. Second suggestion is if you hear the auger struggling, it is. They do not handle nails or screw heads very well. And so if it sounds like you're hitting one, stop, back the drill out and try a different spot. The great thing is who cares? No one can see behind your wall. So if you need to make a couple holes and see which one works, you can. Lastly, and this is the most important, it may seem counterintuitive, but go slowly. If you run your auger fast, it'll heat up, it'll get gunk stuck, stuck in it, and it's gonna struggle continuing to drill downward. Slowly, 90 degree, and uh, well, a lot of patience. Here we go. Okay, there's our flexible auger bit. It made it through the subfloor, no problem. And now we have to get the ethernet cable up through the wall again. Now, I could try to fish this up manually by hand, but that would be uh, ridiculous. And so I'm going to use pulling line. Pulling line is just basically really inflexible um, string. <laughs> it's strong string, but it doesn't stretch. And the great thing about it is, is you can tie it to the end of the auger here, and then I can duct tape or electrical tape the string, the line to the cable, and then I can just pull the bit out of the wall. This string will pull the cable up through the wall, and then I'm done. So let's do it. Except for we're not done because look, we just have two bare cables. There are two common termination types and I'm gonna show you how to do both of them, but sitting at the table, my legs are tired. There are two common connector types and you've no doubt seen both of them before. An RJ45 ethernet connector and then a keystone connector, which is what RJ45 plugs into. Now you can choose to have either in your wall. I've elected to use keystones because they look really flush and you just plug a patch cable, something like this from your device into the wall, but that does require more ethernet cabling. It is a little more tricky and you introduce an additional point of failure. So a lot of people, and I don't blame them, just like to run the ethernet cable right out of their wall directly into the device that they want to um, provide connection to. Either method works, there's no wrong way. Um, you'll just choose what you wanna do and go with it. Okay, you are gonna need a couple tools regardless of method. If you're doing RJ45 connectors, you're going to need this, a crimper. And if you're doing keystones, you're going to need this, a punch down tool. Uh, both methods are really easy and I wanna show you with just a pair of Cat5e how to do each. Go ahead and strip the outer jacket off. You can use a fancy little stripper like I have. I'll link them down below, they're not too expensive. Or you can just use scissors if you want. You'll notice that inside there are the four twisted pairs and then there is this hairy white little cable. This is called a pole line and you can actually tear on it and it will rip the jacket further down. Um, but we need that out of our way and so we're just gonna go ahead and chop that off. Now that the hairy bits are out of the way, we've got our four twisted pairs. There's a little trick that no one tells you that's pretty handy. Uh, untwisting these pairs, especially with Cat6, is pretty tricky. But if you use the uh, Ethernet cable jacketing you just stripped off, you can actually stick it in between the two pairs and then just twist. Okay, once you have your four colored pairs all separated, you need to put them in order. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't necessarily matter what order they're in, so long as they're in the correct order on both ends, but you should really go with a standard because 
technically, and jury's still a lot on this one, some of the pairs are twisted more tightly than others, and so putting them in the correct order, you just, you want to do it. There are two standards, um, T568B and T568A. A used to be very ubiquitous up until probably 15 years ago. Now pretty much everyone uses B. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. Again, just make sure that whatever you pick, you stick to. Most of these punch down tools will have a little guide on the back that tells you what order to put the cables in. So this one is white and orange, and then orange, and then white and green. And you just, you know, you can just kind of pull these cables as you see fit. There's not that uh, much of a reason to stay careful with them. Then we've got blue, which we will bring that one to the front, okay. And now we've got stripy blue. Now we have green, now we have white and brown, and then brown. Okay, so these are all in order, and generally I like to kind of pull on the cable and you know, run them back and forth just to make sure that they correctly stay in place. Uh, are, so we are gonna go ahead, grab our little scissors here, and just punch these down so that they're all the same length. And then you grab your connector, and there are two types of connectors. There are push-through connectors, which is what I'm using, and it's great because you can push the cables all the way through, make sure that they're in the right order before you crimp them, and then your tool crimps and trims them. Or you can cut them down to the proper length, jam them in, make sure they stick, and then go ahead. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I've gotten pretty comfortable with both of them, but punch down is generally recommended for beginners because look at this. I just stuck the connectors through. I pushed the jacket all the way in as far as it'll go and then I make sure that my order is correct, which it is. And then I grab my punch down tool, I stick my connector through, and then I just crimp. I'm done. That's an ethernet cable, pretty easy. Okay, now on the other end, we're going to do a capstone. Uh, these are very, 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 excuse me, a keystone. These are very, very simple. So on the front here, I'm just gonna stick my cable in and then you just wire them down in between these cavities. And the great thing is, is they are um, the right color. So, you know, whichever color is there, you have the solid and the uh, stripe on the same side. So once you've lined all of your connectors up and they're in the correct spot, you need to grab your punch down tool. Now, there are two different types of punch downs. There's 99 and 110. Pretty much every modern thing is, is 110. So you stick this into your punch down tool. This one's kind of cool because it has an impact sensor on it. And so you just push it until it clicks. Uh, I would recommend getting one of these. They are a little more money, but it's better than just playing the game of, did I actually push it in or did I push it too hard and break the jacket? These tools are handy. And then you seriously just take the punch down tool, stick it in the cavity and punch. Pretty easy. Once you're done, you can take the uh, excess connectors, you just spin them until they break off. And now we're done. We have an ethernet cable, RJ45 on one end and a keystone on the other. Now, if you wanna make sure that these work, you can buy one of these. This is a CAT 5E or CAT 6 tester. Now this is a fancy one with a display and it will actually tell you what pins are incorrect in case you did mess up. But there are basic ones that do the same function. You basically turn it on, you plug one end into the uh, keystone or into the one end of the RJ45, and then you plug the other ethernet cable end in, and then you push test and our cable passes, we did it right. And that's it. And with everything installed, the house is complete. Now look, I can't say that it was fun or that I would want to do it again, ever, but I'm getting great speed in just about every room. Stay tuned for a future episode where I will talk about what I plan to do with this 10 gig LAN and how all my smart home gadgets, even the unsupported ones, will reside inside HomeKit on their own isolated network. Get sub for that one because it is going to be an exciting and a nerdy one that you will not want to miss. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you disliked it, well, send it to someone you hate. Thank you so much for watching and as always, stay snappy.